Thank you. Thank you so much. I know it's been a very exciting day, um, and, and there's more to come. And so I'm so glad that everyone's uh, enjoying their meal and enjoying their conversations. And we're just, and you can continue. We're just going to get started really soon, um, we, as we have a special guest waiting for us here. Um, again, uh, thank you again for joining us. Feminist Funded 23. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and you, you know, and also thank you for in, uh, helping have the very first uh, feminist philanthropy on the Hill Day, right, where we exercise our voices. And I know some of you are coming back from some of the uh, programming there as well. All right, well, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Director Jennifer Klein, who is the, uh, I, who is assistant to the president and director of the White House Gender Policy Council, where she has led President Biden as, she, as he first established the Gender Policy Council in 20, uh, 2020, March 2021. Uh, director Klein has worked on domestic and gender global policy throughout her career and has advised the president on issues including reproductive rights, gender-based violence, and women's economic security. During the Obama-Biden administration, Director Klein served as a deputy senior advisor to the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the Department of State. During the Clinton-Gore administration, she worked, as the White House, she worked at the White House in a dual appointment as First Lady uh, Hillary Rodden Clinton's senior domestic policy advisor and a special assistant to the President on the Domestic Policy Council. We are so honored to have her give remarks here today. Uh, thank you so much, and please welcome Director Jennifer Klein. I feel like I'm just going to talk at you, but I'm just going to talk at you. So. Um, uh, Thank you, first of all, for having me. Thanks for that really nice introduction. I can't always help um, other than listening to my bio these days by feeling like, gosh, I got old. How is that possible? Um, but really, most importantly, thank you all for the work that you do every day. Um, because one of the things that I'm going to talk about is how we in the Biden-Harris administration can't be doing the work we're, we're doing without the partnership of all of you in this room, everyone from the philanthropy, private sector, civil society, other governments, other uh, organizations, multilateral organizations. So, um, so thank you, first and foremost. Um, I'm just going to take a moment, as you heard, uh, to talk about the Gender Policy Council, or GPC, as we like to call ourselves, because um, what's a government uh, agency or office without an acronym? Um, and you know, as you just heard, the GPC is the um, newest policy council that President Biden established um, by executive order very early in his presidency. Um, we work alongside other White House policy councils, including the Domestic Policy Council, the National Economic Council, the National Security Council, um, and the uh, other new policy council, which is the uh, Office of Climate Policy, to develop and implement uh, domestic and foreign policy with the goal of advancing gender equity and equality both at home and around the world. When President Biden established the GPC, he charged it with um, creating the first ever national strategy, um, first ever in the United States. I will note at the outset that we've done a lot of learning from what's been done in other countries, um, but the first one for the United States to guide our work on gender equity and equality as a government and as a nation. Um, the strategy sets forth uh, a bold vision centered around 10 priority areas. When I first started talking about the strategy, um, folks would say the, the biggest criticism we got was that it was very ambitious. And I don't need to tell the people in this room that the response was yes, <laughs> because that's what's required. Um, so it's a bold vision that uh, has 10 priority areas from health and education to climate change and economic security to gender-based violence and humanitarian efforts to democracy, political participation, and human rights. Um, and it acknowledges right at the top of the strategy that you can't work on one of these issues without working on the others because it's, they are all connected. And it has at its center another one of the founding sort of principles of the strategy is that we um, approach everything with an intersectional lens. 
recognizing that any policy or program needs to account for the multiple barriers that people face because of race, gender, or other identities. And finally, sort of at its core, um, is a recognition that implementing this strategy is a whole of government effort, and all federal agencies are involved in putting the strategy into action. It also, by the way, recognizes that, um, as I said at the outset, the, uh, it recognizes the role of philanthropy and the private sector as partners, um, as well as uh, civil society and other organizations as we address gender equity and equality in the United States and around the world. This historic undertaking has really already led to real measurable outcomes uh, in the United States and around the world. And if you'll indulge me, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of those today. Um, and as the Gender Policy Council continues to partner with colleagues across the federal government to ensure that it has a long-lasting uh, impact on the lives of women and girls across the United States and around the world. I'm going to really uh, focus, as I said, there are, there are these 10 um, very broad priorities, but I'm going to focus on three priority areas that we spend a lot of time focusing, although not exclusively, and those are economic security, health care, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, and gender-based violence. So starting with advancing economic security and economic justice. Um, you've probably heard President Biden running around the country talking about Bidenomics and growing the economy from the middle out and the bottom up, not the top down. Um, and this is part of the gender strategy. Um, you know, our, our notion is that um, by investing in American workers, empowering American workers, and promoting competition to lower costs for working families, that's how you strengthen the economy by growing the middle class. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic pushed millions of women out of the workforce because they lost their jobs or were forced to leave them to care for their families. And Bidenomics has led to an historic recovery in women's labor force participation and the lowest unemployment rate among women in the United States in 70 years. We still have work to do because women over 55 have not yet caught up to where they were before the pandemic, but other than that, it's actually um, women's labor force participation in this country has actually not only reached but exceeded where we were before the pand pandemic. Um, President Biden's investing in America agenda is mobilizing historic levels of investment in the United States and creating good paying jobs, including union jobs and jobs that don't require a college degree, and jobs, by the way, that many women were historically underrepresented in. Um, so the administration is working to ensure that women have access to these jobs and can build careers in growing industries such as manufacturing, construction, and clean energy that are essential to our nation's economic future and, of course, essential to working families. In addition to investing in America's future, the Biden-Harris administration is dismantling long-standing barriers that hold women back at work and undermine our, women, our nation's economic security. So as part of his executive order on increasing access to high-quality care and supporting caregivers, uh, he has announced the most comprehensive set of executive actions any president has ever taken to improve care for hardworking families while supporting care workers and family caregivers. He signed into law critical family-friendly policies, such as the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act and the Pump for Nursing Mothers Act, that expand workplace protections for women and help them stay and advance in the workplace. And the administration is working to close gender and racial wealth gaps by rooting out discriminatory pay practices and promoting pay equity, including across the federal government. As I mentioned, everything we do is both domestic and global. To just turn on the global side to uh, our work on economic security, um, we've made tremendous strides, I think, to promote women's economic participation globally, um, including by launching a $200 million Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund to promote economic security for women. This also includes a focus on three issues that are essential to participation in the 21st century economy, access to care infrastructure, bridging the, gender digital, the digital gender divide, and third, promoting women's access to jobs in green and blue industries, such as energy, waste management, and environmental conservation. 
Each of these, again, is partners are partnerships with governments and multilateral organizations and the private sector. And each of these is built on partnership with civil society and women leaders in communities around the world. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the first, the Invest in Child Care Initiative, which is a collaboration um, among the World Bank, the governments of Canada, Australia, and the United States, and several large foundations. And through that, we're expanding access to quality, affordable child care and early learning programs globally, which will not only improve child outcomes and family welfare, but women's employment and overall economic growth. We're also working with G20 leaders, just announced last week, to achieve an historic commitment to have the digital gender gap by 2020. We've launched the Women in the Digital Economy Fund, a joint effort of $515 million in commitments from governments, the private sector, and civil society to accelerate progress to close the gender digital divide, which we know undermines women's full participation in our globalized network economy. Second, I'm going to turn to preventing and responding to gender-based violence. Again, domestically, um, I always say you haven't spent any time with President Biden if you haven't heard that he championed and wrote the Violence Against Women Act. He has obviously been a leader in the fight to end gender-based violence um, and violence against women and girls for decades um, and has made it a priority as president. Um, he, uh, in addition to, uh, as I said, writing and championing VAWA, um, as a U.S. Senator, he worked to renew and strengthen this landmark legislation multiple times over his, uh, the course of his career. Actually, tomorrow is the anniversary of the reauthorization of 2022, um, where uh, the, the law was strengthened uh, and expanded, and we were able to secure $700 million in appropriations in fiscal year 2023. Um, which was literally the highest funding level for VAWA in uh, this country's history. So this reauthorized VAWA promotes, and prevent, uh, promotes prevention and strengthens services for survivors of sexual assault, increases resources and support for culturally specific survivors and communities, combats cyber crimes, addresses the growing threat of online harassment and abuse, and strengthens protection for domestic violence survivors at risk of experiencing gun violence. In the executive order establishing the GPC, the president called on us to develop the first ever national plan to end gender-based violence, which furthers our commitment to prevent and respond to gender-based violence across the federal government. In addition, he issued a presidential memorandum which established a White House task force to address online harassment and abuse, um, to respond to the need for government leadership to address online harms, which of course disproportionately affect women, girls, people of color, and LGBTQI plus individuals. And finally, he signed an executive order to implement historic bipartisan military justice reforms that significantly strengthen how the military handles sexual assault cases. Um, this is the executive order that transfers decision-making authorities from commanders to specialized independent military prosecutors in cases of sexual assault, domestic violence, murder, and other serious offenses by amending the Uniform Code of Military Justice, which just, um, just a week or two ago or a month or two ago, um, he uh, did the next executive order to, um, to actually set those offices up and get them going. Again, globally, to combat gender-based violence, the president issued a memorandum promoting accountability for conflict-related sexual violence. And with that executive action, U.S. departments and agencies are literally for the first time being directed to ensure equal consideration of acts of sexual violence and conflict when identifying appropriate targets and preparing designations under applicable sanctions authorities. I just take a moment here, first of all, to note that it is crazy, to use the technical term, that this is the first time the U.S. government has actually made conflict-related sexual violence a reason to issue sanctions against a country or non-state actor, but also the sort of significance. Thank you. And finally, on the, on the GBV front, um, we launched a global partnership for action on gender-based uh, online harassment and abuse, which is sort of the analog to the domestic task force to address this 21st manifest century manifestation of gender-based violence. And we are still looking for 
um, partners. We have, I think, up to 12, or we are now at 12 countries who have joined this partnership um, and are beginning to, um, to take action, really, literally around the world on this issue. Um, and last, but certainly not least, um, protecting and expanding sexual and reproductive health and rights. Again, don't need to tell this crowd that um, this is an issue where we should have should be having a very different conversation, again, both globally and domestically. Uh, sadly, we're not, but, um, but I do um, at least uh, feel um, that with the work of the people in this room and beyond the people who you fund, who you represent, um, and the work that this administration is doing, we are certainly fighting the good fight. And I actually, in a way that I can't quite explain, but I will in this room of friends, feel optimistic that we are actually going to hit a breakthrough. And in some sense, it's because you know, the other side, whoever they are, um, have made some pretty big mistakes in underestimating the power of women, the power of this set of issues, uh, the sort of uh, strong feeling that we are in the wrong place right now. Um, so again, I hope, I hope others feel my optimism in this period of time, which you know, it's easy to not feel optimistic at all. Um, but we are both globally and domestically, again, working to protect access to reproductive health care, um, first and foremost domestically in the wake of the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which of course overturned Roe versus Wade. Um, back to the pessimistic part, um, you know, nearly 28 million women of reproductive age in the United States live in a state with an abortion ban currently in effect. Um, and in this post-Dobbs reality, they are being denied medical care that is essential to preserve their health and even save their lives. They're being turned away from emergency rooms. Um, we saw a suit filed just today by the Center of Repro on Reproductive Rights. I don't know if anybody's here from that organization, but um, this is not the first suit they've brought, but to, uh, to challenge um, that policy in, in states across the country but they are being turned away from emergency rooms, forced to delay care at their own, uh, the risk of their own health, and made to travel hundreds of miles for medically necessary care. So, you know, I hope it has been entirely obvious that this president and this vice president stand with the vast majority of Americans in believing that the right to choose is fundamental and that um, we will continue to call on Congress to restore the protections of Roe versus Wade in federal law which is um, the, the first and most important step to fully securing access to abortion for women in every state across this country. In the meantime, we've taken uh, a series of actions to defend reproductive rights and, and health. Um, three executive orders, uh, including most recently an executive order focused on strengthening access to contraception. So together these, I won't go, them, go through them one by one, but together these orders charge federal agencies to take action to safeguard access to abortion and contraception, to ensure that everyone has access to health care free from discrimination, to support women's ability to travel across state lines for medical care, to protect the physical safety and security of clinics, providers, and patients, and to finally to protect patient privacy and access to accurate information. We're also defending the FDA's approval and regulation of mifepristone, a medication that's been approved as safe and effective for more than 20 years and is used both for abortion and miscarriage management. Just last week, I hope you saw, the Department of Justice asked the Supreme Court to review a lower court decision that if it were to, effect, to take effect, would have devastating consequences for women and undermine the FDA's process for regulating medications that patients rely on, this and so many others. Um, so we're gonna continue to stand by FDA's independent approval of mifepristone uh, and continue to defend access to medication abortion in court. Finally, we're working closely with and supporting leaders from across the nation fighting to protect reproductive rights. This includes state legislators, providers, state attorneys general, advocates, and more who are committed to advancing proactive and protective state legislation even as they respond to over 350 anti-choice bills that have been filed for the 2023 legislation, legislative session alone. At every opportunity following Dobbs, Americans have shown up for reproductive rights, 
from Kansas to California and lots of places in between. Um, and I think that speaks volumes to where the American people are and where women are on this issue. Um, but the stakes remain inconceivably high and we uh, are committed to um, continuing the fight for reproductive rights here in this country. And of course, this commitment expands beyond the United States. President Biden and Vice President Harris have spoken about and protected women's sexual and reproductive health and rights around the world, um, revoking the global gag rule and restoring funding to the United Nations Populations Fund. But again, so much more work to be uh, done around the world. And you know, as I know all of you have experienced yourself, so many other countries looking to us to say what is happening <laughs> and what does this mean for your policies abroad? And you know, I keep saying over and over again, but obviously we collectively need to say it over and over again, this is not the policy of America. This is a policy of some people who, uh, who do not share the, the values and the views of, of the majority of people in this country. Um, so just to, to end where I started, you know, I hope this uh, has demonstrated our ongoing commitment to advancing gender equity and equality um, and um, to assure you that we are going to continue to prioritize these issues, but I really look forward to hearing from all of you. I see lots of friends in the room, and I know I will, about what we can do more, what we can do different, what we can do better. Um, and you know, thank you all, and thank you to the Women's Funding Network for the opportunity, as I said, not only to speak with you today, but really more importantly for the work you do every day to advance gender equity and equality around the world. So thank you. <laughs>